Let's have a look now at our other, other possibility here, that is to use small molecules. So in the coamorphous system, we are using two small molecules, maybe the drug is initially crystalline, and then we use a coformer. This could be another drug, yeah, and if we want to do a combination preparation, or it could be a, an excipient. In our case, we use a lot of amino acids. And what we can do then is um, to make a coamorphous form, and we see, for example, with the amino acids, that we are reaching fairly high glass transition temperatures. This is because the amino acids themselves have a very high a melting point, they have a correspondingly high glass transition temperature, and if I mix them with the drug that has a lower Tg according to a Gordon-Taylor type relationship, we are getting a, a, you know, a Tg somewhere in the middle, so much higher than that of the pure drug. But what is really, uh, uh, really important here is that um, we can save a lot of excipient. Yeah? So if we do a drug-drug combination, we have no excipient, uh, the one stabilizes the other, if we take a drug amino acid, we have the exact same thing that Carl already mentioned, is that we have to consider the molecular weight difference. So if your drug has a molecular weight of over 500, the amino acid has a much lower molecular weight, your weight ratio is something like 70-30, yeah? 70% 70 drug, 30% excipient. You also brought this interesting concept, co-amorphous systems. Um, not many people are familiar with it. Could you perhaps explain uh, what's the difference between co-amorphous and amorphous solid dispersions? How do they compare? What are the advantages of co-amorphous systems? So we just talked about the load and, and uh, how much drug can I actually load into the polymer without risking crystallization of the drug. So how, how much until I reach the saturation solubility. And typically this will not be a very high percentage. Maybe 20, 30 percent of drug can be loaded into a polymer and then you're reaching the saturation limit. So you do have uh, uh, potential challenges there in that you have a high concentration of your polymer. So you have a lot of excipient that you're using. So depending then on the drug dose, if that is high, you are ending up with a large volume of your amorphous solid dispersion, maybe too high to be put into a single tablet. So the co-amorphous systems are different in the, in the sense that we are not using a polymer, but we're using another small molecule. And this other small molecule then interacts uh, with the drug uh, molecules to form heterodimer structures, and these structures can stabilize each other in the, amorphous, in the amorphous state. So one example of these are the amino acids that we have used quite a bit. So by selecting the right amino acid and then using a, a suitable process, such as a milling process or spray drying process, we can form a co-amorphous system in which we have the drug and the amino acid forming dimer type structures that then there is no corresponding crystal structure to, so they are much more stable together than each of one would be alone. And then our ratio of drug to polymer, uh, drug to amino acid, is depending on the molecular weight of the drug and the amino acid. So if the molecular weight of the drug is very high, uh, or comparatively higher than that of the amino acid, we can end up in ratios of maybe 70-30. So we have now a much higher ratio of drug to excipient, which is advantageous for further downstreaming they compare quite well with each other. So the dissolution rates, the degrees of supersaturation we can achieve, and also the physical stability compare quite well with a, a drug polymer mixture. Mm -hmm.